This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. It came about because of the Industrial Revolution, which had the effect of widely separating a person's home from the place he or she worked. The first place would be the home, the second place would be the workplace, and what is the third place? It's where we gather apart from home and work in a spirit of camaraderie and joviality, and we enjoy one another's company, and this has always been a very important part of uh, life in not only in this culture, but in every culture I look at. In 1991, sociologist Ray Oldenburg coined the term third spaces as a way to discuss the importance of gathering outside of the home and workplace. Think parks, malls, libraries, bookstores, coffee shops, cafes, bars, designated spots for local folks to gather. Seems innocuous, but Oldenburg argued that third spaces are crucial to thriving communities, research in the 30 plus years since, and the forced social separation of the pandemic has brought critical awareness to how essential these places are to healthy public and private life. Today on Meet in Three, we'll use Oldenburg's work to explore how food is a means to be together. Whether we're sharing a communal plate or creating a meal, food is one of the most potent things that helps us build community. It's more than just something we eat. Food is at the core of how we connect to one another. I'm Taylor Early, and this is Meet and Three on HRN. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meet and Three. First up, Danielle Flitter shares how food has been the key to finding her community in Mexico. In March, I got a message from my friend Paquito. Oli, oli, Dani. ¿Cómo estás? We've hired a band and my mom is making mole. Are you free to come tomorrow? He asked. For mole and music, of course I'm available. The following morning, I took a three-hour bus ride from Mexico City to Huejotzinco, then got on another local bus to get to the small town where Paquito and his family are from. Earlier in the day, the town celebrated San Jose, or Joseph, with a religious procession. In the afternoon, Paquito's family hosted a lively party for their community. Dozens of people gathered around tables, talking, laughing, eating, and enjoying the music. I found my friends and greeted the family with warm hugs. Right away, Paquito's mom, Lilia, asked me if I wanted something to eat. Claro que sí. But first, I need to see what's happening in the kitchen, I told her. Lilia had nearly 20 people, family, neighbors, and friends, helping in the kitchen. Six women were making handmade tortillas, each having an important role in the process. Rolling the masa into balls, flattening the dough balls with the tortilla press, then cooking them on the comal before placing the warm cooked tortillas under a blanket of woven napkins. In the back, there were two huge cazuelas, ceramic pots big enough to bathe in, filled to the brim with a homemade mole. The two women in that area of the kitchen were tending to the pre-cooked meat that sat in large buckets and served plates of mole as servers came in to fill orders. While the band played on, we ate spiced rice with mole and tortillas, cabbage soup, tamales, nieve, plum alcohol, and dance cumbia well into the night. The next day, heading back to Mexico City, with literal buckets of mole, 
plastic bags of rice, and stacks of tortillas in hand, I recorded a conversation with my friend Alex, who was also at the party. People here have more community bonds than in the U.S. I think even then in the U.S. when we were kids. And the culture is very family-centered. Families are very big and involved. I mean, look at this meal. She just cooked for, like, the whole town. Literally. And that's, like, the honor. It is in gatherings around food that we bond, share ideas, express problems, gossip, learn, and connect. But I think that people talk more when they eat together. Totally. And talking is community. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like you need to share. You need to share with people. Like, yo, what are the tr- what are your tricks right now? Because <laughs> because things aren't going well. In Mexico, community permeates every interaction with food. Whether it is gathering to make tortillas, tamales, or chili sonogada, eating with strangers while getting street tacos, or chatting with Ricardo while he prepares my camote. These exchanges are not just transactional, but truly connect you with the place the vendor, and your food. Simply put, Mexico is... A culture that loves to eat. That's Tierra Darnell, the owner of Black Sea Cocina, Mexico City's first and only soul food restaurant. But it's more than a restaurant. It's a cultural community space. Black Sea Cocina hosts paint and mezcal parties, live music performances, DJ sets, trivia nights, movie screenings, comedy shows holiday celebrations, and so much more. This is, yeah, it's a restaurant, but this is your home. Like, come here, come kick it. Like, you know, sometimes when you you want to go out, but you don't really, like, know what to do or where to go, you just want some place that feels familiar where you can just be yourself. Like, that's what I hope that people feel when they come to Black Skill Cena because that's what I've always, you know, strived to create. I first connected with Tierra at her house house dance party where she invited me to do the first plant-based pop-up at the restaurant. From that experience, my own community in Mexico City deepened and expanded. She's opened the kitchen to many other chefs in the city to host pop-ups, sharing their cultural food from Namibia, Congo, Thailand, and Haiti. And Black Sea Cocina's own evolving menu integrates Mexican recipes like oxtail chilequiles, and supports local farms, especially for growing collard greens. I'm trying to take part in the community and not just take from it. Third spaces like these are essential to our well-being, as they give us a strong sense of belonging, connection, and joy. Finding home in a place that isn't your own isn't always easy, but food fosters community. It's a natural vehicle for connection, Food is communal by nature, from the crop that requires collective effort to cultivate or the animal that yields more than one person can eat. The process of preparing a meal is so intensive that it demands our mutual participation, including cleaning up afterwards. Food is often central to third spaces because of its ability to connect us beyond nourishment. It binds us and helps us affirm our place and identity in the world. In the years since Oldenburg's research was published, there has been much discussion about where third spaces occur, especially in light of our digital social media landscape. But here's a secret. Community isn't always situated in a defined physical space. Outside of the confines of four walls, we can build community based on shared values and interests, or even a shared pilgrimage into the unknown. For our next story, Sophia Hooper brings us far from home to a third space close to her heart. I'm going to take you to a place that I can never go back to. People have found this place for over a thousand years, and it spans thousands of miles. Some people stay for just a week, but others spend months or even years here. This is the Camino de Santiago. It's a network of walking routes that stretch all over Europe. People started walking them as a religious pilgrimage to the spot St. James's remains were supposedly found. I showed up last September. Over 37 days and 500 miles, I had a pilgrimage of a different sort. 
it's a, the greatest example in my experience, at least of um, just continual anticipation of food. The trip is physically intense. My idea of luxury quickly narrowed to just a few things. Food to eat, friends to share it with, and a safe place to rest after a long day's walk. Food was just a wonderful gift along the Camino because it, it met a real need, the need of nourishment, and it didn't add any burden or weight to our packs because we would just eat it together. I recall arriving alone in Estella and seeing a pilgrim who I had met before in the grocery store with others buying stuff for that night's meal. I was heartily invited to participate. From then on, I rarely walked alone. Walking the Camino is like living in a small town, if that small town moved every day. Even if you start your day's walk alone, Everyone's going in the same direction, so walking into the first cafe on the road at breakfast time is like walking into your own neighborhood bar. You know everyone, people are trading gossip and returning lost items, and... You got your, like, wounds examined over someone's breakfast. Yeah, very proudly. That guy was very glad to have my blister over his (laughs) omelet. Somehow, we found a way to get each other almost everything we could need. You've been hearing the voices of the people I met along the way. Esteban and I found each other over coffee and cake, both grievously injured, but he was handling it better than I. My friend Carlos showed Lynetta that you could pick the ripe green figs in Navarrete. And when we found each other at the church that day, she gave me one too. So it was this wonderful communal experience of everyone sort of passing through the same few tables. The people you sat down with were not the same people that you stood up with. It was this wonderful way to sort of see your entire communal community at once. I think third spaces are like that. I think food is like that. It's not the thing itself. It's the space it makes for all these intangibles. Feeling present, knowing that the people around you know who you are and that you matter to them. The place I'm sharing with you is gone because the dozens of people I walked with have all scattered to their homes and lives across the world. But something new forms every day on those roads, as new pilgrims start their journeys and as old ones return to the Camino to experience something new. We'll be right back with more Meet and 3 after a brief break. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Wisconsin, the state of cheese, makes half of the nation's specialty cheese and wins more awards than any other state or country. Our heritage and traditions master cheesemaker program, and the American propensity for innovation all put Wisconsin on the cutting wedge of cheesemaking. With over 600 varieties of cheese to choose from and 5,500 national and international awards and counting, get ready to turn your refrigerator into a trophy case. Enjoying a Wisconsin cheese is basically like winning a gold medal in culinary achievement. Set your mind at cheese. When you bite into a wedge of Wisconsin Wonderful, you know it is made with the ultimate skill and passion possible. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. When we look around at the state of the world, it's clear that having the safety to enjoy traditionally called third spaces is a kind of privilege. But in reality, third spaces are an important tool to surviving and thriving. In our next story, Addison Austin Liu explores how refugees find and build community in a new home by sharing the food of the places they left behind. When I'm away from home, one of the first things I miss is the food. My mom's tortellini chicken noodle soup, my dad and I sharing an omelet at a greasy spoon diner. Quintessential things that taste like home. But imagine if those memories were all you had left of home. 
This is the reality for 120 million people who have been forced to leave their homes due to war, violence, or persecution. Refugees and asylum seekers often flee with no more than the clothes on their backs, and maybe the recipes they remember. Spice Kitchen Incubator is a project in Salt Lake City, Utah, run by the International Rescue Committee. They provide refugees resources to start their own food business. Program manager Emily Park attended the French Culinary Institute and worked for 15 years as a chef and bakery owner before joining the IRC in 2020. Right now we are working with uh, 39 different entrepreneurs representing 31 businesses. Uh, They represent the culinary traditions of 29 countries on five continents. As it turns out, many of the entrepreneurs in the program already come from restaurant backgrounds. So we have a sister duo. They grew up working in their family's restaurants. We have another gentleman. He ran a five-star restaurant in Syria. I have no business telling him how to cook, nor do I have the business of telling pretty much anyone in our program how to cook. Spice Kitchen creates a safe and supportive environment that approaches business ownership from a holistic perspective. It's a comprehensive program that offers financial training, marketing support, and connection to the wider Salt Lake community. Entrepreneurs also receive access to an affordable commercial kitchen space. But the food itself is at the heart of it all. It's where you get to come together and talk about your day. You share your traditions. It can take you to a specific time and place while also creating those new memories with the people that you're sharing the dish with. Spice on 9th, the program's new home base, is designed for sharing food, stories, and cultural traditions. What started as a small cafe and business center is now being reimagined as a vibrant hub for pop-up dinners, caterings, and artisan food markets. One entrepreneur has already held a fashion show to support fellow refugee artists while introducing attendees to African food and music. It's their space. This is their program. We want them to feel like this is owned by them. So we have some incredibly talented, ambitious folks in our program, past, present, and hopefully future. uh, And we're just here trying to make sure that they have what they need to succeed. Spice Kitchen Incubator is built from the stories of the refugees who have devoted themselves to bringing their food to the Salt Lake community. We are the lucky ones to be learning from and supporting them. Sharing a meal across cultures creates understanding and hopefully safe space for all those taking a bite. Food is one of those, I like to call them the three common languages, that they're universal no matter where you come from. Um, Obviously it's music, it's laughter, and to me the most important is food. Dust off your bell bottoms. We're time traveling back to the 1970s. This was an era where feminist activists didn't just ask for a seat at the table, they built their own damn restaurants. For our last story, Jessica Gingrich explores how these radical restaurants connected communities with a shared dream of a more equitable future. A woman rushed in, almost breathless, saying with an Irish brogue, I just arrived from Ireland, and this is the first place I wanted to visit. Now, this is like 1976, and before the age of the internet, I just thought, how did you know? Imagine her stepping into Bread and Roses, a women's restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The aroma of freshly baked bread fills the air. Feminist anthems play softly and the walls are adorned with empowering posters. Pat Hines, a co-founder, explains their vision. We advertise Bread and Roses as a place for women and their friends. Our primary goal was to provide a feminist social and cultural space for women with weekly speakers, performances, and art exhibits. It was much more than a restaurant. It foregrounded women, it was proud of women, and it gave women every opportunity to be active. This sense of empowerment wasn't limited to bread and roses. It was part of a much wider movement. Food and gender studies scholar Alex Ketchum has chronicled over 230 feminist restaurants across the U.S. and Canada 
between 1972 and 1989. They were founded oftentimes by collectives, oftentimes by women who are lesbian or some of the women who today might identify as queer. The restaurants were grassroots efforts built by and for the community. To basically renovate a dank old bar into a very charming and attractive place took a team of women carpenters, uh, women electrician, uh, women painters, sheet rockers, etc. The only thing we needed to hire a male for was plumbing. We also had a unique fundraising model. We sold 100 shares to 100 women for $100 each and raised that $10,000. These restaurants offered a radical alternative at a time when it was frowned upon for women to dine alone in public. And so the idea that you could have a space that welcomed women to come in by themselves, women to come in with others, other women, this was something we, we lacked and, and needed. But it's hard to balance community, equity, political ideals, and profits. Many struggle to stay afloat. It's really hard to have a socially justice-minded project underneath capitalist structures. What oftentimes happened was that the people who started the restaurant would actually just not pay themselves properly, which could lead to burnout and infighting. Despite these challenges, their impact is undeniable. I would even say for the ones that closed after 18 months, which sometimes would happen, that doesn't mean that they weren't successful. They still had an impact on their community. The communities these restaurants built continue to flourish long after they were gone. There's a lot of different ways to mark success in a business, right? For places like the Brick Hut Cafe in Berkeley, California, which existed for 21 years. There's a Facebook remembrance group where people talk about the recipes that they used to eat there. They talk about memories they had there. So, you know, that really shows the impact that people are, you know, 20, 30 years later still saying, like, I wish I could go back to that place. Hosting events, creating a safe space, and paying employees a living wage. These were the real measures of success. As we continue to grapple with gender inequality, the lessons of feminist restaurants are as relevant as ever. They show us that creating spaces centered on community, equity, and belonging is not just possible, but essential. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. This episode of Meet and 3 was reported by folks from our third space here at HRN. Danielle Flitter, Addison austin Liu, Jessica Gingrich, and Sophia Hooper, with support from Elizabeth Fisher. Meet and 3 is produced by H. Conley and me, Taylor Early. Our audio engineer for this episode was H. Conley. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc and that's all spelled out.